Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I'm Angeliki Savropoulou, Scientific Project Manager at ILSI Europe, and I'm very excited to welcome you today to this introductory webinar to our new activity on food allergen quantitative risk assessment. I'm delighted today to moderate this webinar, and I will present you now our speakers. After a short presentation of ILSI Europe and its Food Allergy Task Force by uh, Isabel Guelings, Scientific Program Director at ILSI Europe. We have the chair of this new activity, Ben Remington, who is, um, who is an uh, adjunct assistant professor uh, with uh, food allergy research and resource uh, program at the University of Nebraska, and he's also managing director at Remington Consulting Group. Marty Blom is scientist at TNO, focused on solving research gaps in food allergen risk assessment. She leads the research team in the TNO shared research program line for allergen and allergy management, and has also a guest research position at the University Medical Center Utrecht. Stefan Ronsmans is responsible within Coca-Cola's EU territory for risk assessment aspect of food safety related topics related to product portfolio and ingredients. This encompasses management, managing the major relevant food safety discussions ongoing in Europe in the scientific and regulatory domain, ensuring business continuity for the existing supply chain and capturing and evaluating new opportunities in the domain of strategic ingredients and additives. Neil Bach is a regulatory toxicologist with 20 years of experience managing safety topics in the FMCG sector, including product innovation, emerging regulatory issues, and improving risk assessment for better con consumer protection. And Michael Walker, who is the vice chair of the expert group, is a consulting analytical scientist with a focus on research on food allergen analysis. He leads a team in the UK laboratory of the government chemists resolving technical disputes in the food control system and is also a honorary professor in the Institute of Global Food Security in Queen's University, Belfast. So some Practical details about today's webinar. At the end, it will be some time for questions, which you can post on the question box in the right of your screen. And to facilitate that, you can include the initials of each of the speakers, which you can find in the bottom left corner um, of your screen for uh, each slide. Also, please note that the webinar will be recorded and available soon after the session in our website. And with that, I would like to give the floor to Isabel to start the webinar. Enjoy. Thank you, Angeliki. What a nice program we have for this webinar. And I'm delighted to present the scientific program director, Ilse Jörg Ivanacci. Ilse Jörg is a European branch of an international non-profit organization that aims to deliver science-based solutions that improve public health and safeguard the environment. And we do this through a unique approach, an approach that exists out of four different steps. The first step is about collaboration. We foster collaboration between industry, academia, and in governmental institutions. The Food Allergy Task Force is a perfect example of such collaboration. On this bar chart, you can see that the Food Allergy Task Force consists of industry experts, academics, but also, also a governmental representation. And the task force goes beyond. We also include patient organizations and healthcare practitioners into their activities. These stakeholders identify common three competitive challenges. Within the Food Allergy Task Force, they focus on establishing consensus on science-based approaches for food allergy risk assessment and management. They focus on different components of risk assessment, 
ranging from hazard intensification to the prevalence uh, of exposure. Once these common challenges are identified, they assemble science. The food, allow me to highlight one of the recent publications made by the Food Allergy Task Force, published in a journal called Allergene. Few of the upcoming publications are related to approaches to define tolerable risk, and a second manuscript will be, will be about analytical methods suitable to verify vital 2.0, 3.0 allergen reference doses. But we go further. We don't stop our publication. We also communicate and disseminate through the classical challenge like international conferences, where we have our presentation or poster presentations. But a webinar is also a perfect channel to do science dissemination. Today, it's not about disseminating finalized work, but it's about introducing a new activity and inviting stakeholders to contribute. So now I allow I give the floor to Ben to go further on the presentation of this new activity. Thank you, Isabel. Again, my name is Ben Remington, and it is my task to give you an introduction to our expert group regarding allergen quantitative risk assessment. So I'll begin with a first slide, a brief introduction of who we are. So as an expert group, we have individuals representing industry, academia, governmental organizations spread out across the European Union, as well as North America. And we will get into a more detailed introduction of individuals during each individual working group later in the day. In general, I would like to start with an introduction of hazard versus risk. Now, this is based on an infographic provided by the European Food Safety Authority, and they've very clearly illustrated that a shark in the sea is a hazard, and it only becomes a risk when you leave the beach and start swimming with a shark. So, standing on the beach, you're never going to be at risk of a shark attack, but if you start swimming, then it's possible that it becomes a risk. So, differentiation between a hazard and a risk. Now here you can clearly see the fin, but what if you cannot see the fin? Do you swim? What's your own personal risk assessment in that situation? Now, what if you see signage that says, may contain sharks? How do you handle that? Do you, do you still swim? Or do you stay on the beach? And again, to take it one step further in this, this example, what if you know the decision to place signage should be based on quantitative risk assessment? What does that sentence even mean and does it change your personal risk assessment? Do you still stay on the beach or knowing that this water may contain sharks, do you swim? So this is a question you can ask individually. It's a question you could ask as a company, uh, especially if you are a beach manager responsible for hundreds of beaches throughout the world. You might have some questions uh, if this is the first time you've ever seen the words QRA. Uh, you might be asking, what is a QRA? What is a quantitative risk assessment? Are all quantitative risk assessments the same? Uh, do I actually need to do one? There are quantitative risk assessments. There are all different forms of risk review and risk assessments that are not quantitative or semi-quantitative. So, do you actually need to do a quantitative risk assessment? And then finally, do I as a beach manager need to do a unique quantitative risk assessment for each of my 150 beaches? Or are there beaches that you can group into similar categories and have the same risk assessment, risk assessment applied to those different beaches? Um, for example, if one of your beaches happens to be a landlocked mountain lake in the middle of the Swiss Alps, do you need to do a risk assessment for sharks? I would say that you don't have to. You can just leave the signage off the beach and put your time, money, and efforts into other places where there would be more beneficial to an actual risk assessment and not on a landlocked beach in the middle of the mountains. So this is a nice, funny example to set 
this scenario a little bit, but it does pertain to real questions that are raised within food companies around the globe regarding may contain labeling and if quantitative risk assessment is to be used, what, what are the questions and, and how do we actually do that? So not all risk assessments are the same and quantitative risk assessment is not always the answer. As you can see here, if you look across the risk matrix, there's going to be situations with very clear answers, whether it's a very low risk in green or a higher risk in red. And these clear answers do not warrant further risk assessments. You either have a clear no risk or a clear risk, but those yellow areas in the middle, those represent areas with more questions, more possibilities where guidance and information and education could help further your risk review process, give you a better risk review, a better risk assessment, and could potentially contain a quantitative risk assessment if necessary and if called for, but not always. So it's an area that could definitely use some further guidance. Some areas of interest for food allergen risk assessment can include, but are not limited to precautionary allergen labeling and the decisions of to apply or not apply uh, these labels, supply chain management, possible production errors or incidents, and another wide range of possibilities. But the rest of my presentation is going to focus on these couple scenarios. So using PAL to set the scene, it's well recognized that it has potential benefits, but also well-known drawbacks. There has been a global desire to make PAL more beneficial. Uh, and in the current situation, it would be a step forward if reference doses based on scientifically set milligrams of allergenic protein were to be used in labeling decisions. However, there's still a risk if these reference doses are not used in a responsible manner. So if you conduct a bad risk assessment, your answer will still be bad and it does not help anybody in that situation. If PAL is pushed to be based on risk assessment or quantitative risk assessment, it may increase effort and confusion by various stakeholders, including the food industry, allergic consumers, or governmental organizations. And there's a clear and present danger of inappropriate, uninformed, or inaccurate risk assessments if proper guidance and education is not available regarding risk assessment or quantitative risk assessment. The result of this could be increased cost, increased labeling, and increased mess, and no benefit to the allergic consumers who we're all trying to protect. So what is this expert group about? We would like to define QRA and the different iterations or levels of detail that QRA may stand for. I'd like to indicate when and where QRA is possible, reasonable, or even needed. So it's a very big step to identify if you even need to conduct a QRA. And then we'd like to highlight the different QRAs out there that could support PAL decision-making processes, the supply chain management, or production incidents as the information needed for each of these could slightly differ. So if QRA is to be done, provide guidance on how to gather that needed information, identify the necessary methods you might require or points of value judgment within the risk assessment and information needed can differ per assessment. So we would like to highlight where these differences can occur. Finally, we'd like to indicate when do you have enough information available to take a decision so you are able to take a decision and not left in a pattern of needing more information before risk assessments can be finalized. So as an expert group, it's preferable that we do not reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of good information out there on how to conduct allergen risk assessments and guidances in different jurisdictions. So we would like to point to that good information where available and provide added value when necessary and, and when data gaps do exist at the moment. It's also preferable that every scenario does not lead to an academic level of probabilistic risk assessment with 15 different input variables. It's something that should be able to do be done within a single company, something that your employees after training should be able to do. It's preferable that every scenario does not lead to more analytical testing or require consulting with an outside QRA expert. Again, after training and education, this is something that you should be able to do inside of a single company. And it's also preferable that every scenario does not always have a need for more information before you can take a decision. So we'd like to indicate when you have decision-making points within a QRA or other risk assessment 
and when you need more information or when you actually have enough to move on, finalize the risk assessment and go forward. So to that thought of not reinventing the wheel, on screen now you see the allergen risk review tool, something from the Allergen Bureau down in Australia, and it highlights the process of thoroughly investigating the allergen status of a food. Now this is an online interactive tool for education and training around allergen awareness and allergen risk review, something I highly recommend for anybody in the food industry to take a look at and, and get more information about allergens. Now, I'm going to use it because it also gives a nice overview of the production process from incoming raw materials and incoming goods through production of a food product, packaging, labeling, and shipping out to the market. So it gives you a full overview there, something that we can visually identify how our expert group will tackle this situation. So at the ELC expert group here, we're going to be split into three working groups covering the entire production process. And these are going to be introduced in seven minute presentations in the following minutes after I'm done. So the first working group up, working group one focuses on cross-contamination and precautionary allergen labeling. Now these cross-contamination assessments, they're done within your established operations and risk assessments. This is something within your normal HACCP and GMP. Second working group focuses on the supply chain. This is going to be things about upstream communication with your supplier, part of your normal due diligence, and part of that establishment of transparent information flows throughout the supply chain and how to enable a risk assessment later in the supply chain when needed. This working group three is production errors and incidents. Now these are unanticipated situations and errors outside of normal GMP or change management. So this covers the entire food production chain from supply chain to production facilities and it's going to be some very helpful example based guidance and training. Together these three working groups will highlight different forms of quantitative risk assessment, the different information needed, and they're going to give you a sneak peek at the expected outputs in the coming presentations. Again, to wrap up the introduction, our expert group is trying to account for consensus on the most appropriate methods for risk assessment. It's also trying to account for the diversity of risk assessment problems and a reflection of the true nature of the supply chain and diversity of food production processes. We're looking to improve the overall implementation of QRA when it's necessary across the food production chain and harmonize the reasoning that goes into decision making, whether it's for labeling or product recalls. So with that, I would like to turn the floor over to the individual working groups for their presentations, starting with Dr. Marty Bloom. Thanks, Ben. This presentation will show you in a few slides what the focus is of our work group and what we hope to achieve as an outcome. We are setting this up with several experts in our subgroup who are Fleur de Moy, Senior Food Safety and Toxicology Scientist at Danone, Joseph Baumert, Director of FARB, Food Allergy Research and Resource Program, and Professor at the University of Nebraska, Luca Buccini, who is Scientific and Regulatory Consultant and Managing Director of Hilo Bates Consulting, Simon Flanagan, Research Principal and Global Lead in Food Allergy and Allergens at Mondelez International, and myself, scientist and risk assessor at the Netherlands Organization of Applied Scientific Research. As Ben presented in the introduction, this work group assumes that established operations and risk assessment for producing food products are in place and that producers are operating under normal HCCP and with good manufacturing procedures. What have we set for ourselves as a task in this work group one is that we want to give guidance on identifying how and where in the production of producing a food product it is appropriate to use a quantitative risk assessment. And the focus is therefore on the allergen cross-contamination that might occur in this food production process and might lead to a precautionary allergen label on the finished product. <laughs> 
allergen management risk reduction measures should be put in place to reduce allergen cross-contamination and only in the case the scale of this risk cannot be avoided then a PAL is applied. And therefore the focus is on the food business operators that will be validating the production process and assess the possible risk of an allergen cross-contact. A further focus in this work group is therefore on individual producers, a single food production process, and it is not dealing with what happens in the supply chain. This is more the focus of work group two. Uh, though of course we need the information coming out of this supply chain in order to do a proper risk assessment. A further assumption is that we develop an approach for productions under normal conditions and not what to do in case of production error or incident, which is more the focus of work group three. But of course, the synergy uh, with the other three, two work groups is evident. And uh, as a wider ILSI expert group, we will look at what is developed across the three groups, make use of each other's knowledge and align what will be developed. And important, we will make use of guidances and best practices available. What is an expected outcome of this work group? Now, we hope to develop a systematic, harmonized approach to assess risk in individual steps of the production process. And this approach should guide the user in uh, identifying the key elements and areas in allergen management, indicating uh, usefulness of applying a quantitative risk assessment, as in many steps, a qualitative assessment is sufficient, Give the requirements of the inputs for the quantitative risk assessment, such as what information is needed to assess the risk, and providing guidance on how to gather and qualify the needed information. In the next few slides, I would like to present you with a sneak preview on how we envisage this. First of all, we want to develop scenarios that represent the complex production lines and indicate the areas where cross contact with allergens may occur. Here you see an example of such a production process in which the blue blocks indicate different steps of the production. And the first block for here at the beginning, number one, is the part where the incoming goods arrive. And then you uh, see all other parts up to the packaging and dispatch of the final product in the numbers 10 till 12. And based on several main characteristics of food production, we think it should be possible to develop uh, those scenarios that can be representative for many production lines. And for each step, it might be possible to indicate areas for potential risk of cross contact with allergens. So these are displayed here with a red flag, but also indicate areas where there is no problem, the green check marks. And in this phase, you only mark the spots where there might be a potential issue. In the next phase, it should be identified what appropriate risk assessment approach to take, because during validation of steps, it might not be needed to do a quantitative risk assessment. And where there were initially many areas of risk, the red flags, this can now be narrowed down to a few flags where it is feasible to do a quantitative risk assessment. In our example here, many red flags will disappear with two possible areas remaining where quantitative risk assessment has a potential added value. Next, you should be able to identify if it is re even really needed to apply a quantitative risk assessment at some of these steps. And in our example here, one flag will be remaining as the other red flag could be solved with a simpler risk assessment and risk mitigation methods instead of using the more intensive quantitative risk assessment. Such an approach might save time and resources that can be used for other parts. So we see, do see several challenges to be taken uh, with our group. For instance, we should keep a balance between simple and providing useful details. Production processes vary considerably and it might therefore be a challenge to develop the scenarios in such a way that it provides useful insight and guidance for the users. And it might be a challenge to uh, give guidance on the use of a quantitative risk assessment for particle cross-contamination. For instance, one particle like a walnut can contain sufficient protein to cause already a reaction.
And what can also be a challenge is to decide when you do have enough data for a quantitative risk assessment and make a useful risk management decision. And we will likely come across more challenges while developing this approach. But I will end here and hand over to Stefan. Yes, hello everybody. So um, as introduced by Ben, uh, this working group is specifically aiming at the supply chain and the uh, issues related there to allergens management. You see the four people that are involved in this. So besides myself, there is James Hindley, the executive director of Indoor Biotechnologies and also the chair of our task force. There is Mirte van Dungen, the regulatory toxicologist at DSM Food Specialties. Ben, you've heard him already, the adjunct assistant professor at the University of Nebraska and the managing director of the Remington Consulting Group. So what have we set ourselves as a task? Um, well, it is how to obtain and communicate reliable information on allergen risks across a global supply chain for the purpose of quantitative risk assessment of ingredients and finished products. Now, the certain elements to be considered there. The first one is the question on how to identify best practices in the domain of supplier management on allergen risk, both in the case of initial assessment of such risks as well as for changes in the status of allergen risks over time. The second uh, element to be taken into account is how to define the type of information that needs to be gathered by suppliers so that it can serve as an input for a total supply chain QRA afterwards. So practically spoken, what type of info is needed uh, at the beginning at the supply chain with suppliers so that it can really serve also in the total supply chain QRA that uh, we want to do. Third element to consider is how to gather data um, in a global, very diverse legal framework of allergens. Anybody working with allergens knows that uh, when you look at the uh, different allergens that are being legislated across the world, they're not the same. So if you're operating a global supply chain, that is something to be very aware of. And the fourth element is how to consider the very diverse complexity and expertise within supply chains and the supply chain capability to deliver different levels of detail of information. So that might, for instance, be very different when you work with a small supplier of a small ingredient at one side of the globe versus working with a, a big supplier with a lot of staff uh, closer to your own organization. A couple of challenges, therefore, to be tackled. Um, first, the design of a data collection system taking into account the different allergens being regulated in different geographies. So I mentioned it already, in some areas of the world uh, where you buy your ingredient, celery for instance, might not be regulated, but where you are commercializing your product, uh, it might be. So how do you deal with that? Um, it's also captured in the second bullet point. How do you deal with a simple, between brackets, one jurisdiction type of supply chain, for instance, your entire supply chain is within Europe, or you have to deal with global supply chains. And then the question is, how do you identify best in class approach and balance that out with what is feasible for those type of supply chains to obtain uh, the necessary data? Last element on this slide, can the level of detail of required information be related to the actual risk an ingredient represents in the final product? What does that mean? Well, if an ingredient, for instance, uh, with a certain allergen risk related to it, in the end is going to represent 30% of the volume of your final product, that might be a different uh, discussion than when such an ingredient uh, is only added in a couple of PPMs itself in your final product. So those considerations might also have to come into play when considering how to gather the data uh, within a supply chain. The last slide already is continuing on the challenges here to be tackled. So besides finding info on the amount of a possible allergen cross-contact event, can we, with our system that we're looking for, also gather data on the likelihood of such an occurrence taking place? Can a data collection system also consider the circumstances, um, both when uh, a risk 
is occurring in a homogeneous way as well as when it is um, happening in a heterogeneous way. So for instance, if a risk um, risks happening um, with a particulate, which you could um, um, consider to be a heterogeneous risk, you don't really know when exactly it will happen. It might be a different way of collecting data than when a risk is happening in a homogeneous way, meaning it has happened to your ingredient, but actually the risk is spread homogeneously over the entire batch of the ingredient uh, that you are being supplied. Last but not least, is a data collection system capable of adding an aspect of reliability of the obtained data? So in other words, when in a supply chain um, you uh, receive data from very much the beginning of your supply chain from uh, uh, an ingredient, uh, is that data based upon anecdotal evidence? Uh, is that based upon auditing data? Is that maybe based upon real analytical data that show you a certain level um, of, uh, of cross contact? Um, for instance, uh, to the previous point, have we been able to identify whether the risk is homogeneous or heterogeneous? So all those data uh, we, we consider to be uh, the reliability of the obtained data and that needs to be assessed too. So this is already my last slide, again aimed at identifying in our group how to best work with uh, the supply chain in order to obtain data that we can then later on translate and calculate into a quantitative risk assessment of a final product. With that, um, I end my presentation and I would like uh, to turn the floor to the Production Errors Working Group, uh, to which uh, Neil Buck uh, will introduce us. Thanks, Stefan. So as you say, I'm, I'm presenting on behalf of the Incidents Work Group. And the incidents work group is composed of a range of experts in the allergy space, not just from academia, but also from governmental bodies and also industry. So we have Rene Crevel, uh, we have Michael Walker from the Laboratory of the Government Chemist, we have Si Wang from PepsiCo, Bushra Jared from University of Manchester, and Marianne van Ravenhoest from the Allergen and Consultancy in the Netherlands. So this is the question that we are aiming to address. So when and how should quantitative risk assessment be deployed to support allergen management decisions in the case of incidents? Now, how we've defined incidents is as follows. It's the unexpected and previously unaccounted for presence or potential presence of allergen in a foodstuff that has been produced, distributed or retailed necessitating risk assessment, including when appropriate, QRA to inform risk management action. So clearly the QRA that is being performed is to inform risk management action that is quite different from where QRA has been uh, used mostly in the past, which is to inform risk management action around precautionary labeling decisions. Where in this case, our risk assessment is intended to inform risk management action, which is around decisions, for example, whether to uh, release a product or withdraw it or recall it. So we are intending to understand how best to apply this equation. So not just that, of course, risk management action is a function of risk, but risk is a function of hazard and exposure, which of course is the, the quantitative risk assessment element, but also of likelihood. Because in many cases, when we're talking about incidents, we're talking about things that may have happened, that are possible incidents. And there is this aspect of, of likelihood to factor into the, the risk assessment equation. So as per the other work streams, our objective is to develop a systematic and consensual approach. And that's in the context of how you apply risk assessment for incidents in collaboration with you as stakeholders. And these are the steps essentially that we are going through. Firstly, is to clarify what we mean by incidents. And this is gonna be example driven. And then through those examples, identify when QRA is 
appropriate to apply. And then if it's appropriate to apply, identify if it can be applied based on the data and knowledge available. And then if it's appropriate and it can be applied, understand the mechanisms by which how it should be applied. So essentially it's to develop a framework to understand when and how QRA should be used in the context of risk assessment of incidents to inform risk management decision making. So in terms of understanding what we mean by incidents, we've been through a process of identifying what could be different types of incidents that are present across the supply chain from commodity level to finished product level. And also we went through an exercise of thinking about what's the general level of concern of those different incidents. And so for example, um, a fairly uh, a not infrequent incident of having revised uh, precautionary labeling information via, through the supply chain that's not been pre-planned is perhaps a, uh, a less critical incident than when there is a wrong ingredient that's been supplied or a, or a wrong ingredient that's used. And those mismatches of ingredients and packaging are classically what present the most concern in the context of incidents at market. And then for individual types of incidents, what we've been doing is unpicking them in terms of what information is available to us at what stage of the incident. And it came to our minds as we were going through this process that actually there is a, a hierarchy, a, a tiered refinement that's possible as you progress in the assessment of an incident. And that where you are in that, that tiered hierarchy depends on the, the knowledge that's available to you. And this is the sort of thing that we've started to put together in terms of unpicking those individual incidents. So this is an example of um, that many of you may be aware of over the past few years of, of peanut contamination of garlic. So we started in a situation where there was a, an anecdotal awareness that there may be some systematic contamination of garlic coming from a particular region. And as you work through the incident and data is generated, then we get to the stage where we find that it is appropriate based on the information that's available to us to include quantitative risk assessment as part of the, the wider risk assessment of the, um, of the incident. And then eventually we get to the point where uh, we can perform what's called a, a verified risk assessment, which is where we can actually do a quantitative risk assessment on finished products. And these are the sorts of, um, the sorts of templates that we've put together to, to work through these examples and, and unpick um, what we mean by incidents and how different incidents are best dealt with and how quantitative risk assessment fits into the process of, of understanding the risk presented by those incidents. And so the challenges for our work group are essentially, firstly, when QRA should be applied. So as we think about the different tiers of refinement of the, um, of the, the risk assessment, we can see that at the, in the early tiers, when there's little data available, naturally, of course, quantitative risk assessment is, is rarely appropriate or indeed possible. And then in the later tiers, when there's much more knowledge in terms of both the, uh, the presence and concentration and also consumption of, uh, of the food in question, then QRA is, is often appropriate and is possible. But there's this whole space in the middle where depending upon the sort of incident, it may be appropriate or it may even be possible to conduct quantitative risk assessment. And then of course, we have challenges in understanding how QRA should be applied, particularly in the assumptions that are made around input data and the value judgments that are made, the calculation methods that are appropriate to apply, for example, with um, particulates. And also, uh, we want to get to a point where we develop a, a systematic approach of communicating the output of 
our incident risk assessment to risk managers. So in essence, what we're doing is an example-led review of incidents. So when to apply QRA, how it should be applied, and how best to uh, communicate. And now we're handing over to, to Michael Walker. Um, well, you've heard about ILSI, the Quantitative Risk Assessment Activity, and from the chairs of the three working groups. I'd now like to spend five minutes on how you as stakeholders can contribute, because without broad consensus, our work will not be of maximum benefit to consumers or businesses or regulators. We've targeted a group of about 50 stakeholders, but we also welcome everyone who's tuned into this webinar because we want to benefit from as wide a range of advice as we can. We're on a journey with you, our stakeholders, and we've made contact with over 50 of you in a broad range of disciplines and over a broad range of geographical areas. And we want to go wider. We've opened up this webinar to everyone so as not to exclude anyone with an interest in what we're doing, because working in a transparent way will lead to better outcomes. And there's the core expert group, um, there's the wider stakeholder group, and then the general stakeholder audience. And we want our work grounded in consensus around decision making. And here's where you can help. As critical friends, we need you to ask us questions and make suggestions. And, and there are lots of questions. It's a big step to identify if you even need to conduct a quantitative risk assessment. But we want to know, for example, are our, are our, are our approach, approaches robust, relevant? Are we accurately mapping the problems? Are we getting the balance right? Do our inputs reflect reality? Are our assumptions realistic? Have we missed any showstoppers? Are we asking the right questions? For example, how to evaluate exposure, what toxicological value judgments arise and when, and importantly, how do we minimize the potential for different decisions by different actors in the supply chain and in regulation? And will our work reduce the potential for cross-contamination in the supply chain? with allergens? Will it refocus precautionary allergen labelling to when it's absolutely necessary? And so will it help people with food allergies and businesses and regulators? Your questions and input will be vital to our planned virtual digital workshop in the autumn. And we may circulate a survey to ask you what the most important questions are for you. And you'll have your own questions and suggestions, and we don't want to constrain you. Please think outside the box on what we're proposing. The digital virtual workshop will occur in the autumn, and we'll send a draft for a comment to you before the workshop. Then the workshop will take place. And following the workshop, which will improve and consolidate the draft, it'll go to a peer review publication. So what's the format of the autumn workshop? We're, we're looking at a, an electronic platform which will give us enough functionality to do it well. It will be no more than four hours duration. There will be breakout groups, electronic breakout groups with a maximum of 10 to 12 persons per group. And we'll kick off with a welcome and the first 20 minute breakout session will be to you to get to know your group and their interest in the activity and then we'll present progress. And there will be three successive breakout sessions to discuss each of the three working groups activity and then feedback to the whole group and close. So how does it all fit together? And how do you as stakeholders contribute? Well, you'll contribute by critically reading and commenting on draft documents especially by attending and contributing to the workshop or by email if you can't get. And what we hope is to achieve consensus decision outcomes from exemplar scenarios. So you'll get a draft document for a peer review publication, which the workshop will expand upon 
and then the publication which is submitted will include the workshop feedback. And then that will progress to a draft guidance document, which of course will be uh, a much higher word count than you would be permitted for a peer review publication. But peer review is very important to us to get scientific uh, robustness and review by our peers in the scientific community of what we're doing. But the final workshop then in 2021, which we hope will include some face-to-face -face interaction, will lead to uh, a much more detailed guidance document, a much more detailed gui guidance document than could be submitted for peer review. And that will then appear as a traditional ILSI black and white report. And you see an example of that sort of report up on the, the right-hand side of the screen. And at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the link to similar such reports. And that's where we'll place open access our final conclusions. The activity timeline then will be dealt with in more detail by Angeliki, and she'll take you through that in more detail next. Thanks for listening. So thank you, um, Michael. Uh, I will show you now the timing of uh, what Michael has just presented, as well as who is involved at its event. So in the first stakeholder digital event in October, November this year, the expert group and the stakeholder group will work together as explained. And more or less eight months later in Q2 to 3, 2021, the second stakeholder event will take place. In between these two events, the peer-reviewed publication will be submitted and upon acceptance will be av available for everyone, as it will be also uh, for the final guidance documents that will be finalized and published after the second event in Q3, Q4, 2021. And before continue with your questions, I would like to refer back to the different levels of participation. So due to logistics, uh, we have limited uh, the position to the, for the stakeholder group. But the good news is that there are still some available positions. So if you would like to actively participate to the outcome of the activity, send us your CV and your motivation, and we will be more than glad to consider you for participating to the stakeholder group. And with that, uh, we will go now back to Ben uh, for the Q&A session. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Angeliki. Uh, so it's my pleasure to open the floor up to questions. Again, there's been a, a prompt ongoing during the webinar to submit your questions. Uh, hopefully on your screen, you also see a chat question box. If you enter any questions in there while we're going through the Q&A, they will pop up for us to, to address as well. Uh, we have received a few while the slides are going on. And the first one that I would like to tackle goes out to Stefan Ronsmans from the Supply Chain Working Group. And the question was that it's, it's often uh, difficult to obtain good allergen information from a supplier. Sometimes your sheet or information sheet may ask for it, but even though it's indicated on the sheet, it's not answered by the supplier. So um, are you planning on forming some questions or some sort of uh, conversation piece uh, for guidance when discussing these allergen issues with suppliers that could be used by the industry. Yes, thank you very much for that question. Um, very interesting question indeed. Um, our intention is to, to design a best-in-class communication system between a supplier and a customer. Um, design it in the best possible way to get the data in the best possible level of detail but also keep it feasible now the challenge that was mentioned that sometimes you know your initial answer will not be um, sufficient enough certainly not if you want to use it for qra uh, well i think we've all across come across that situation in the past so it is a very good idea to maybe uh, include a couple of guidance questions or ways to um, go about such discussions 
uh, in the template that we're envisaging. So that is certainly a, a very good idea and, and thanks for, for offering that idea. Okay. Thank you, Stefan. Um, next question comes to uh, Marty. Um, you mentioned some examples going for your, your working group regarding cross-contamination or cross-contact analysis. But do you already have an idea of how many scenarios or the types of examples that you'll be using uh, for your working group? Thanks uh, for this question. Um, yes, we indeed have looked at this uh, as a start in our subgroup because, of course, the variety in the productions is enormous and how can we handle all those different um, um, production lines, etc., and all the variation. For instance, there is uh, there are small businesses with only a few people, uh, up till many people, or there's a high turnover of products, or only a small. But if you generally look at it from uh, with a more general view, then um, you can say that the homogeneous cross contact is different from a heterogeneous cross contact with particles so that was a start for our uh, developing scenarios and the second uh, part which is yeah generally uh, different between uh, companies is that you have but uh, dry productions and uh, wet productions so we took those four, uh, yeah, uh, four situations, a wet production with a heterogeneous or homogeneous, or a dry production with a heterogeneous or homogeneous, those four scenarios as a start to develop our um, guidance and then see later on if we need to um, add more or can even reduce our scenarios. So that's as a start. Okay, great. Thank you, Marty. Uh, while Marty and Stefan were, were answering their first two questions, we've had a couple come in regarding the stakeholder group or stakeholder participation. Um, the first one is actually going to go back to Neil Buck uh, regarding working group three. And the question was asking if it would be helpful to have input from food inspection authorities on the national or EU level. Uh, within your your working group. Yeah, thanks, Ben. I think that's a, that's a really good question, and actually, it's not something that personally I thought of actually before, and that's why it's so helpful to have the stakeholder group, isn't it? Um, so actually, there there is representation in the stakeholder group from authorities. Actually, it's 15% uh, of the stakeholder group are from authorities. However, um, it's true that that tends to be from central authorities, who then, of course, are connected with inspection bodies. And it makes a lot of sense to me that inspection bodies should directly be involved in the activity, especially because this is intended to be, well, the output is intended to be a very practical guidance on, on how to implement quantitative risk assessment. So as close to the reality as possible makes a lot of sense. And unfortunately, as, as we heard from Professor Walker, there, there are still some places left in the stakeholder group. So we should explore that. Um, so I, I would encourage uh, stakeholders if they've got any suggestions for who may be additionally involved in the stakeholder group uh, to, to contact uh, Angeliki about that. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And that does tie into our next question. Um, and that's about the stakeholder involvement. Um, so to Michael, uh, or to Angeliki. Uh, let's start with Michael first. Uh, is there going to be a participant list for the stakeholder group or how will stakeholders be involved um, and acknowledged in the document preparation? Okay, thanks. Thanks for that question. It's, uh, it's traditional now in, in published papers to acknowledge uh, all, all the contributors who have given intellectual input and there are various ways of doing that and we can have uh, uh, an author list which expands beyond the expert group uh, and we can also then have a subsidiary author list which uh, would go in as an appendix but certainly uh, those contributors who um, 
the effort into helping us in in the workshop will be acknowledged in the publication. Yeah, I would um, I would also like to uh, add to what uh, Michael said. So um, the expert group uh, it will be they will be authors for the publication, and um, uh, we will consider how. Uh, the rest will be uh, added either, as Michael said, an appendix or for sure, but for sure everyone will be acknowledged in the acknowledgement session. Okay, um, thank you, Angeliki. So we've had a couple questions come through regarding the analytical process, and um, one was asking where might uh, analytical analysis come into the different working groups. So I wanted to start with uh, Stefan and see where um, where you might see analysis coming into the supply chain working group or, or guidance, if, if at all. Yeah, thank you, Ben, and, and thank you for the person raising the question. I, I think it definitely has its role also at the level where you try to obtain the information uh, between a supplier and a customer of a certain ingredient. And, and that's a, a two-way communication for me, right? So it is always good to uh, have a good communication there based on a good template that allows you that communication. But there is much more than just analytics. There is much more than just the PPM landing on that sheet. So you, you need to be able to talk about the GMPs, the the um, precautionary measures that are being taken in the uh, in the supply and so on. If that is all, let's say, discussed to the liking of both sides of the discussion, then analytics obviously bring a good uh, additional verification level. So it, it definitely has its role in there, um, but one shouldn't see it as all encompassing and, and a number on itself uh, on one or two samples is definitely not going to make uh, uh, the full conclusion on itself. So it is part of the discussion, I would say. Okay. Thank you, Stefan. We had a, a second question to Marty on this specific one is, should it be an extra process step within working group one and, and cross contact cross contamination or uh, is it built into the different process steps along your uh, example that you showed on screen? Uh, yes, I'm in, I'm muted. Yes, sorry, the 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 go to webinar said something. Uh, indeed, um, the uh, uh, analytical is um, not taken. The analytical the analysis is not taken into account. For, is not per se needed for every step in your uh, scenario. There are steps in your scenario where you look at uh, what is happening and qualify that um, analysis is not the best step forward. So with every step in your process, you look, is it really needed or not? For example, in the first step of your um, scenario, you can look at, uh, uh, for instance, the incoming goods. That was the first step for a uh, scenario that we described. And then you say, okay, for the, for the packages that are coming in, if it is breached, um, you don't have to analyze. You can have a risk management procedure in place to do that. Or if an ingredient is coming in, and that is the link with uh, uh, also with the supplier group, um, if that ingredient is at very present at very very low levels, you don't have to analyze or de don't need the quality, quantitative information um, to do a risk assessment. And so you can go to every step and see if it is really needed um, to do a analysis. Okay, thank you, Marty. Um, we had a couple questions directed towards Neil. Um, and the first one that I'm going to hijack the answer a little bit there is the um, first one was coming asking about the different populations that you might target a risk assessment to or the communication, whether it's to the general population or accounting for the percentage of allergic individuals within 
the overall population. And it was asking if the goal was to specifically focus on the allergic subpopulation when presenting risk. Um, for that, for the communication answer, I would say we need to tailor our communication to the uh, stakeholder that we're talking to. Uh, so some people do prefer seeing a risk in the overall general population. Others prefer to see it in a subpopulation or more on an individual level. So uh, I think communication needs to be tailored to who you're, you're speaking to. Um, and I'll let Neil add on to that if you, uh, if you see. Um, and the second question was, will you rank uh, allergens based on hazards and put more focus and effort on the hazards that are more likely to occur um, in, in foods? So ranking some allergens over others in which ones you'll focus your efforts. Thanks, Ben. I, I think the, the second question is, is difficult to answer in a general sense because what we're dealing with when we do a risk assessment is we're dealing with individual scenarios on their own merits. So um, I, I, as you've talked about already, it really depends on, um, it depends on the, not just the likelihood that actually the cross-contamination has occurred, but the, uh, the, the concentration of that cross-contamination, but also the food product that it goes into um, in terms of the consumption volume. Uh, and also, of course, the, the amount of product that may be uh, implicated that it's at market uh, and the likelihood that allergic consumers may come into contact with that food. So in terms of ranking different allergens, I, I think that's a really uh, difficult subject um, because, as I said, firstly, there's this issue about we need to deal with uh, each um, each uh, risk assessment on its own merits. But also, of course, um, ranking of allergens is problematic, especially if you are a person who is allergic to a particular allergen and that allergen may be less prevalent in the, uh, in the overall population, you are still vulnerable to that allergen uh, compared to others. So although we may rank it as being uh, less important compared to allergens that have a higher prevalence across the population, it doesn't help you if you're the person that's allergic to it. So there's a number of different angles to it, I would say. Does that help, Ben? It, it does help. I have one short follow-up for you to reply to. Um, the, the frameworks or the guidance or the, the things that we're taking a look at, while they are not specific to a single allergen, that's, that's also the, the benefit of them. They can be applied to many different scenarios, many different allergens. So the, the starting framework for risk assessment might be the same, but in practicality, if your company deals with one allergen more than another, you in practical terms might end up prioritizing allergens. Is that, is that possible in your eyes? Makes sense to me. Okay. Um, last question on the Q&A here as we're, we're five minutes over, and I want to state if we have not addressed your question yet, we will answer it by email. Um, and the last question ties on very well to that. So it's asking when the specific documents of this presentation will be available, as sometimes you have to think first to generate meaningful comments. So I'm going to turn the floor back over to Angeliki to answer that question and to close off the webinar. Yeah, thank you, Ben. So the, vid the webinar will, is recorded and it will be um, within one week uh, available to our website and we will notify all our attendees uh, with a link to the um, website so you can uh, easily uh, access the recording. And uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, all uh, our speakers for today and for this great webinar. Uh, as I said, the question, as uh, Ben said, the questions um, that we didn't uh, had the time to uh, answer, uh, they will be answered afterwards via email. And uh, we will also circulate a survey um, as um, Michael mentioned regarding uh, the questions uh, and what are the most relevant ones. So uh, have everyone um, a good day or good evening, and thank you for uh, attending.